Representative Julie Harhart, and welcome to a Legislative Report. Uh, we are in the uh, at the Diamond Fire Company in Walnaport, and tonight I am having uh, an event here, uh, which I consider to be very special, uh, honoring our veterans who served in the armed forces. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of a ceremony, and uh, we are going to be uh, also giving out uh, certificates and some medals, thanking them for their service. And what I also like to do is uh, I like to hear from some of our veterans that we have here tonight. And we I have one right here with me, uh, Mr. George Miller. Welcome. Julie, Welcome to my event. Much. What do you think so far? Oh, it's a great event. I, I, I thank you very much for having it. it it's, it's something that everybody really appreciates. Um, I'm really happy with that. I want you to tell me, what branch of the service did you serve in? I was in the United States Army, and I was Transportation Corps. And what do you remember uh, most about your time in the service? I spent my active duty 13 months of it in Korea, learning the language, learning the culture, representing my country, and meeting people from all walks of life. So you actually can speak Korean? At one time, I had a fairly good vocabulary in Korean. <laughs> it's been a few years, though. Well, well um, it must have been a good experience for you. Though. It was a great experience. I, I think the event that I remember the most, so I was there the night they took the Pueblo, and we thought we were going to war that night. Wow. Hmm. That would have been January of 68. 1968. Yes. Just a few years ago. A few years ago. <laughs> seems like yesterday. Um, and what are your thoughts in, the, in general about your service and, and your service to, their, to our country? What I think is the famous duty, honor country. You, you, you know it counts when you're there. If you mess up, you know you could hurt somebody. You know there's risk. And you're representing your country. It's, it's, it's an honor, really. The locals talk to you, they ask you a lot of questions about your government, your food, your culture, and you know you're speaking for your country. How do you feel um, veterans are treated by those um, who didn't serve, and how should they be treated? I personally use the VA services and I'm very satisfied. I have heard others speak that maybe they got lost in the shuffle. Um, we all put ourselves on the line during active duty. You don't know when you're going to get shot. You don't know when you're not going to eat. They should be treated as heroes, not as not as outcasts and not forgotten. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. That's why I think these type of events are very, very important. Um, what should young people know uh, about the role veterans play um, and the whole story have played in, in America and the story about that? Well, you go back even to the time of the revolution. Military is here to defend the country. Uh, the military is your first defense to make sure you have your freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's everybody's duty to respect, encourage, and back that. Mm -hmm. Is that what you would tell our young people of today? That's what I would tell them. And I would say, it, boy, it sure wouldn't hurt you to do six months of active duty. <laughs> and what did you um, earn or take away with you from your time that you spent in the military? You, you learn the basics of discipline, you learn the basics of leadership, you get to interface with people from all walks of life. I was fortunate in that I had an ROTC commission and I was a company commander, so I commanded about 400 troops. And it's, it's a workout. You learn. Each one is different. You learn how to motivate. You learn how to organize. You learn how to control. You learn how to direct. You learn camaraderie. You learn esprit de corps. You know, I still have many, many friends from the military 40 years later. Do you get together? Do you have reunions? We have a reserve unit reunion every two years. There's less and less of us at the last couple, but yes, probably my two best friends in the world are people that I met at age 21 in the military. Well, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for telling us your story and your thoughts about this, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Julie, thank you. We have about 70 veterans here that we are going to be honoring tonight. George Miller is just one who told his story. We will be hearing from other veterans um, as the evening goes on and hear about their stories. Donald Burdick, U.S. Army, 16th Field Artillery Battalion, World War II, Battle of the Bulge. David Schoenberger, U.S. Navy, E3, Vietnam.
Ruth Nafis, United States Army Nurse Corps, Second Lieutenant, Peacetime. I was only 18 when I went over. I turned 19 in Vietnam. So I was, <clears throat> I was still, I was still a little boy yet, basically, teenager, and uh, went right over there. That was my first assignment right after AIT. I served in the United States Navy aboard the USS John R. Perry from 1963 to 65. I served in the uh, United States Air Force active duty from 1982 through 1986. I took a 20 year break and decided to go back in and serve my country with the Pennsylvania Air National Guard in the, at the Harrisburg International Airport where I'm currently um, doing my service. I was in the Army. I served for three years from 43 to 46 and I was in the 3rd Squad, 2nd Platoon. K Company, 394th Infantry Regiment, 99th Infantry Division. I served the United States Air Force from 1963 through 1965. My most horrid experience was April 29th when we liberated the concentration camp at Dachau. That was the crowning glory of the end of our so-called combat. I feel very good to the fact that I did some kind of a service to some people. Uh, what we did there basically was, as we say, liberated. Uh, how can you say someone was liberated when they basically had nothing, period? I mean, they had nothing to eat, no clothes, where are they going to go? So how can you take somebody and say you were liberated? In other words, if you open the gate, where can they go? What can they do? Couldn't eat solid food. Didn't know where, where they were, where they come from, where they're going, who their relatives were. A lot of these people had a tattoo. And quite a few of these people, through malnutrition, that tattoo was their name. And it disappeared. So who are they? Who were they? Well, I remember it was both fun, because I met a lot of new people, and it was exciting for a young kid. And it was uh, very intense, because I was on the battle staff uh, during Vietnam. And uh, as such, I worked in the blockhouse, which was a very massive building uh, with five foot thick walls, supposedly atomic bomb proof. And from there, we strategized the war. Uh, what sticks the most is uh, my service with my uh, fellow soldiers in Iraq. I learned a lot, uh, a lot of experience from A to Z. Something we train back here, but we never see over there. Something we experience there, but we never get the training here. And I worked in the factory to fill up, uh, putting powder into bullets. It's a it was a long room, but small. I went in there to put the powder into it. I'm using my hands to speak too. And then after I checked that out, I stepped out and I had to lock it up and put my glasses on to look and see if the thing was working. So if it did, then I pushed another button and made it go around and fill the, and fill the, uh, the bullet. That was it. I was proud. I was stationed in Key West, Florida. We uh, mainly uh, were patrolling the Caribbean, you know, with Castro being in there uh, shortly after the Bay of Pigs uh, and that whole mess and the blockade. So, uh, yeah, anytime anything happened uh, in uh, the Caribbean, we were there. Plus, we were down in Gitmo Bay, which was a, a training center for all the East Coast ships. So we went down there one month at a time and they went through every drill you could possibly imagine to make your ship ready for anything. And um, at that time, Castro had shut off the water to the base. So uh, they, all the ships 
that came in port had to give water to the base because water was more precious than booze. You know, so they were building a couple of evaporators and they brought a tanker in to make fresh water and, uh, and eventually they corrected that problem. But uh, in, the, in that particular time when I was down there, that's what happened. I, w I would have to say when I, was, when I was actually stationed in Izmir, Turkey, near the Aegean Sea, and I think when we were under martial law and I actually saw armed Turkish national soldiers on the streets, I was very nervous at first. But as I got acclimated to their culture, I, I thought of it as nothing else, just as a regular citizen walking out with the normal Turkish nationals, and I became part of them. That's what really, really stuck in my mind, living in a city as an actual citizen without any type of Air Force base. December 19th, we got backed into Baston. We don't say we retreated, we say we withdrew. <laughs> and uh, we got in Baston, became completely surrounded. Uh, it was in January where the temperature was running between one or two degrees above zero, snow up to our knees. Most of us were dressed in half and half, half winter clothing, half summer clothing. Uh, when we got back into there, we had little or nothing in the way of ammunition nothing in the way of food. They had captured our uh, medical units. We had no medical supplies. Anybody that was wounded was taken into the one corner of town down by the railroad station, which was where the so-called hospital was set up. We had nothing to treat them. Basically, they were just there waiting for somebody to come through with something that could medicate them or take care of them. We had nothing in the way of food rations. Uh, we could start no fires because we had no gasoline if we wanted to start a fire. So there we were, just waiting and holding, just waiting and holding. Anna, tell me about Gold Star Mothers in Lehigh Valley. What's your organization? Our organization is based on mothers who have lost their sons or daughters uh, due to the war or as a result of the, that war. And Carol, what do you do as a group? Uh, offer support for each other, uh, seek out other uh, folks to lend your support to them? Yes, um, basically we support one another and we also do a lot of nursing home visits, uh, do pizza parties and things like that and support our and support our veterans that are still with us and we do that in because of our children um, just to honor our children and just to thank the veterans for what they have done for us because without their service, we wouldn't have the freedoms that we have today. If someone wanted to contact you to find out more about your organization, what would they do? Um, they can actually contact me. Uh, my email is C-A-R-E-S-H-1 at verizon.net and um, I'd be happy to talk to them and let them know what we do and if they're a parent that qualify as a Gold Star Mother, we'd like to have them in our group. You mentioned uh, doing this as a way of honoring your children who served and were tragically uh, uh, didn't come back. Uh, would you like to take a moment to, to talk, say a sentence or two, about your particular situation? Uh, my son Mark was killed in Iraq in 2007. He was an Apache helicopter pilot and he was shot down. Uh, Anna, your situation? My situation is a little bit different than Carol's. Um, although Nick has served uh, nine months in Afghanistan, uh, when he had come home, he suffering from a very bad case of PTSD, which ended up that he ended up taking his own life. And it was about a month after he returned from Afghanistan that um, his illness was extremely bad, and he ended up taking his own life. He was 23 years old. What would you like people to know, people who haven't suffered the tragedies that you have, about um, the young men and women who go out and serve, and many of them come back and, and are affected in some way um, in, in, and react in different ways to that experience? Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that um, when our young veterans are coming home. Um, a lot of them are suffering from this PTSD, and it's a major issue, you know, to a point where more of our returning veterans are committing suicide due to PTSD than we're actually losing over there. Um, and that doesn't 
you know, that doesn't take away from anybody um, because they have all died due to this war. Um, everybody needs to understand that we're here to honor not only our children, but all of them, the ones that are coming home. You know, let it be known that we're available to help them in any way. We can get them jobs. We can place them in housing. Um, we. You know, we can help them in any way they need, counseling. Um, there are several, you know, organizations that we work with uh, hand in hand to help our returning vets um, that are suffering from PTSD. So, you know, we would, we would rather them reach out to us and, and just, you know, use our, you know, our avenue um, rather than continue losing them to suicide. Anna, Carol, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming here tonight the men and women who have served this country as members of the military. We would also like to welcome the women who worked in the factories that produced uh, munitions and war supplies during World War II. We appreciate all you have done to further our country's mission of freedom and democracy. Since the 1930s, Hundreds of men and women from Lehigh and Northampton counties have answered the call to duty and have protected democracy around the world. From Europe to Korea and Vietnam to Desert Storm and even the current war on terror, we have given some of the best years of your young lives for a tremendous cause, that of liberty and freedom. After the difficult and life-altering experiences you had during your time of service, you came home still re reliving the horrors of the places you've just seen, dealing with the injuries you suffered. But because you also came home needing to find work to provide for your families, you picked up the pieces, put your lives together, and started anew. For that, we are ever so grateful. Some of you uh, may not believe you are heroes, that you are just doing your job, however, Whatever it was on the battlefield, in the air, or at sea, you have touched the lives of so many people as heroes. I believe it's not only fitting, but most importantly, our civic responsibility to never forget nor take for granted the vigilant sacrifices each of you have made on our behalf. May you never forget this nation remains free because you fought to keep it that way. Laura, talk to us about your organization, which is uh, Warriors Watch Riders. Yes, hi. Um, we're from the Warrior Watch Riders. Our organization is a troop support organization that was created by a Vietnam veteran, Wayne Lutz. And um, his mission is never again will another American warrior be scorned or ignored. So what we do is we welcome our troops home. We see that another American warrior is not scorned or ignored. We also do send-offs for kids that are going to boot camp or going um, on to another deployment. Um, we also honor our fallen heroes um, by doing funerals or by welcoming them home, a Vietnam veteran at a, a party, um, any type of situation like that. Um, we also have another organ sister organization that was created by Wayne Lutz, which is the American Warrior Watch Coalition. And with that, they're all accredited, approved organizations that if you want to donate to another troop support organization, they are all accredited. And we have over 100 organizations that are in that one, um, and that's a Warrior Watch Coalition. Um, so that's basically what we do. We may go to a picnic where a Vietnam veteran or a veteran is, and we just may mug and hug them, which is where we thank them, and we shake their hand, all of us that attend. Um, a flag line is where we all line up with our three by five American flags, and um, we either have the honoree walk through them, if we're at a funeral, the family members, and, and that will walk through, and we just stand there and we honor the fallen. Um, an escort could be something from the airport taking the troop home. Um, so some, some, um, some missions have all three, some are just, you know, one element. Um, so some of your missions, as you, as you call them, and with the name uh, of Warrior Watch Riders, I'm, I'm assuming they involve motorcycles. So that's, that's, that's probably, I would think, one way of, of capturing the public attention is to see these motorcycles, correct? Correct, exactly. That's what um, Wayne wants. We're the Rolling Thunder. They 
we bring the motorcycles, bring the attention, and then people are, you know, what's going on, and that brings the attention. However, any mode of transportation is fine. Um, our main thing is we need bodies. We need the community support to come on these missions. You don't have to be a veteran. Um, I'm not a veteran. My son is an active vet, and that's how I got involved almost four years ago when they brought my son home. And I had all three elements. We went to the airport, and we had over 200 bikes escort my son home. And it took me a month to come down from from it, and, and here I am, you know, giving back and supporting as much as we can. I was uh, not the brightest bulb in school and, uh, and joined the Navy while I was still in high school because I figured that was my be best option. And I didn't want to draft it, so it's, the Navy seemed a good option. And it was definitely uh, a new beginning, I call that. Uh, for You get a lot of new beginnings in life, and the Navy was a new beginning for me. It showed me a whole new world out there and, and gave me an opportunity to learn a trade that uh, served me well for the rest of my life. It, I think it taught me to respect veterans. And after the Vietnam War, if, if anybody remembers how the Vietnam veterans were treated, it wasn't very kind. And many of the Vietnam veterans didn't even want to mention that they were in the military. Uh, through that experience, I think I go out of my way to thank every veteran for their service, no matter when they served. And to this day, if I see anybody with a hat or a uniform, I go out of my way and say, thank you for your service. It's important to recognize that. I did it like probably everybody else did, man or woman. It's, it's being a patriot, it's, it's doing your duty. Um, I really say it's for my duty. I, I mean, my father was a Marine. Uh, he, he served 30 years and my mom's brothers were Army and Air Force and they kind of paved the pathway, if you will, for me. And when my dad was a Marine and I saw the uniform coming back every time he did his drill, it kind of made me say, well, why can't I do that? And, and you know, with the Cold War and stuff back in 1982, it was a rough recession. And, and that also gave me something to do. I wanted to get, gain an education and also serve my country, too. When we were more or less drafted, we went in to literally fight a dictator that was taking over countries. And we thought we were helping out these people because we didn't want them to come over in our area. And near the end of the war, we saw the atrocities and realized what these people had given up. So it got to be a point where it kind of turned around that we were fighting the war to serve and hopefully that we could save our liberty, our freedom, our independence, and our rights. So it ended up kind of a, a two-sword uh, war, so to speak, a defense and fighting for hopefully what well, we could save our, our freedoms. I'm proud that I served. Uh, I'm very glad that the opportunity was there, that I had parents who had both served in the Army and were very uh, positive about my enlisting and very supportive of my time that I served. It made my experience much richer than I think it would have been otherwise. The people that I met, the job that I did, totally irreplaceable in civilian life. I mean, it was fabulous. I was satisfied that I, I did my duty all the time I was in the Earth service. And uh, to this day, I'm always very proud to stand up and be a veteran. And I'm proud to stand up and be an American. I, I did it for the money. Uh, being patriotic and all that didn't, doesn't really mean much to you when you're young. Uh, I just wanted a job. I wanted to get out of the house, so that's what I did. And I liked it. I liked it, so I, I kept re-enlisting and re-enlisting. My thoughts are every, everybody in this country should get the military training. Everyone should serve. That way they know Freedom is not free. Uh, a lot of people are enjoying the freedom, but somebody paid the price for that freedom. So if everybody serves at least two years, not more, at least two years, that way they get the feeling of it.
It's now free. I felt terrific. I was proud of it, very proud. I, we carried, when we made the powder into the bottles, our hands were yellow and our hair was yellow. And when we walked around the town, I know where you live, work, I know where you work. <laughs> and I, I liked that. I was proud of, real proud. God bless them, right? I think they should be given an outline of right from the very beginning of the men and women who gave their lives, gave their time, gave their talent, gave their blood for and their sweat for this country, that they understand that there were real people there that formed this nation as it exists today. It's not a myth. They're real, honest to God people who formed this nation. Just listen to somebody that has served or go out and maybe see if you can find some, some literature. But I, I think if, if, if it's instilled in the academics arena, that would be a great starting place. And I can tell you at Northampton Community College where I'm a part of the Band of Brothers Club, um, they have veteran service representatives there. And they tell you know other people about what we do. And we get out there and we interact with them. So it, 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 there's various avenues. Schedule a field trip where you're gonna get to meet with the veterans. That way they can learn a lot more. Or have the veterans come to the schools. A lot of schools do, but they need to do that more often. This country became great because of its military abilities to fight as a team, to think as a whole instead of just individually, but yet to understand that the individual is the most important part of the unit. Because without one, the unit is nothing. We are a whole, and that's what makes this country great. Like that I was born basically as a Christian, and you were taught basically, uh, you know, do not kill, you know, but when you get into war, what do you do? And it became a question of survivorship. It's either going to be you or going to be them. And so some of your Christian values got turned around. And that was kind of hard for me to kind of figure out again. As a young guy of 19 years old, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. And I learned the fact that comradeship and being loyal, uh, being uh, truthful, uh, learning the lessons of, of life, I'll, I'll help you, you help me. That's all for this evening's show. If you have any questions about what you have just seen, please contact my office uh, in Slatington or Northampton. Their phone numbers will appear on the screen in a minute. Thank you for watching.